Hey everyone. Today I have some maps here that I got in the post box. There are these three of Hawaii, one of the national park ones that we've seen before of the volcanoes, one of the big island, and then I have this one that says discoverers of the Pacific from the National Geographic Society. These three were sent by Colette, who added this beautiful little card with what looks like poppies in different colors. And this one was in the package I got from Fred that I mentioned last time. We looked at one of the maps that was included when we had a look at the languages of China. And I figured this is a great coincidence and we can combine these maps. Let's start with this one here. It's a bit large, so let's see how we can fit this. There's quite a lot of information on here. On steering by stars and sea. On the different kinds of boats that were used. And in the middle we have a beautiful map and I think we should start with that one. So let's move this up to make some space. So, we're looking at the Pacific Ocean. We have North America here on this side. And there's Asia and Japan. There would be China here, just off the corner of this map with Taiwan looking out. Philippines. And here we get to New Guinea, and then here's Australia. We're looking at the large part in between these continents, so between the Americas, Asia and Australia. can immediately see that we have some different color-coded areas. The one here in the center, or multiple ones in the center, are labeled Polynesia. But here, a little to the side, we also have Micronesia and Melanesia. And if we're looking at Hawaii, which is up here, a little further north, we're looking at what's called Polynesia. These are many, many different islands from Hawaii, basically to New Zealand, where related languages are spoken. And we have some background here on how these islands were settled or specifically when they were settled. So it starts off with the light pink region, Melanesia. 
and it says this is the region of first human settlement in the Pacific and it was inhabited more than 25,000 years ago. From there we make quite a big jump. First we get to... Where do we have this? This darker area. And that's where something was found called Lapita pottery. Found from New Britain to Samoa and Tonga. And that reveals the presence of an ancient seafaring people the immediate ancestors of the Polynesians. So people moved from here outwards to the islands. Let's have a look. We have a lot of European names here, like New Island, or um, the Santa Cruz Islands, New Caledonia, New Hebrides. And New Britain would be here and the Bismarck Archipelago and then we head to Samoa and Tonga that's the Tonga Islands here Fiji and Samoa would be here a little further north Micronesia so Again, but further north, received voyages from the Philippines, Indonesia, and islands north of New Guinea um, between five and four thousand years ago. So people moved here north into this region, the Marshall Islands here, the Mariana Islands. And then Polynesia, which translates to many islands. So it's first settlements in Tonga and Samoa some 3,000 years ago. So number four, this would be here then. Tonga and Samoa, which we've mentioned before, with the Lepita pottery. So where did people move from here? can see the orange area, number five, all the way out here past Flint Island to the Marquesas Islands, but also here a little north to the Ellis Islands, and uh, what else do we have? Polynesians from Tonga, Samoa and Tonga sailed east to the Marquesas, north to Tokelaus, right here, into Ellis Islands. So all this happened about 2,000 years ago. And then we move onwards from the Marquesas Islands. So we get to the green part, number six. Around 1,500 years ago, explorers reached Tahiti and Easter Island, later establishing themselves in Hawaii, New Zealand, and various Eastern Polynesian Islands. So we get to Hawaii, get to the Easter Island, and to New Zealand which we've looked at before. Here, this, I guess that's the salmon colored area, number seven, then becomes the religious and cultural capital of the Society Islands, about a thousand years ago. From here, high-ranking adventurers sailed to establish their rule in Hawaiian Cook and Tubai Islands and to the Tuamotu Archipelago. So that's quite a large area here. Yellow, number eight. You have 
Polynesians began exploring back towards Melanesia and Micronesia. It says here, fierce Tongans ranged far to the west and north to dominate West Polynesia. And then we have a lot of info on here. I find this a really fascinating map because it's so detailed. We have the equator here. In Hawaiian, it translates to path of the navel of the sky god, Wakea. We have the Tropic of Capricorn in the south, which translates to, in Hawaiian, the glistening black path of the god Kanaloa. And in the north, we have the Tropic of Cancer, the glistening black path of the god Kalni. We also see here pretty much on the same area here, we also see just a little bit south of the Tropic of Cancer, the path of Arcturus, about 800 years ago. Arcturus is a very bright star. And it says here, Kturos followed a path slightly north of Kauai in um, 1200, and now it passes over the island of Hawaii. That becomes important when it comes to navigating this ocean. And in the south here, we also have a very, very bright star, the path of Sirius. And I think we'll have to open them up a little more. So, because this here is really fascinating. We have people establishing so the area here in this region. This was the center that's mentioned here. Uh, the religious and cultural capital of the Society Islands, right here. How do you get north to Hawaii? To me, this looks pretty impressive because there's just a whole lot of water and it's really difficult for me to imagine how to find your bearing when there are no islands, nothing to see on the horizon. But people at the time managed quite well and they had lots of different tools that we'll look at in a second. But let's first go through this explanation here on the path to Hawaii. So we start at the Marquesas Islands. Hawaii is discovered before the year 750, probably by Marquesans searching northward for new land. Once out of the doldrums and in the grip of the northeast trade winds, their canoes were to the northwest resulting in a landfall at Hawaii. So we have the doldrums. That's explained here. They are a belt of calms and light variable winds found just north of the equator. So the equator is here, and these winds are here. And the northeast trade winds are a bit further north here at about 10 to 20 knots. 
In the south, we have the southeast trade winds at 5 to 15 knots, and the south equatorial current, which flows westwards at 15 to 25 miles per day. So, we're starting north. We get to the doldrums here and then get to the grip of the northeast trade winds and the canoe and the canoe swerves to the northwest. There we go. And we get to Hawaii. Voyages from Hawaii. Hayatea, which is here, to the Hawaiian Islands set a course to windward of the estimated longitude of their destination. And then Arcturus becomes important. When Arcturus passes overhead, the canoe turns west and falls to start to the island. So B. Go in this direction. And then we have Arcturus here, and we can turn to the Hawaiian Islands. In order to return, the course is set to windward of the destination. After landfall at a familiar island or upon reaching the latitude of Sirius, the navigator turns west to Hawaii. So we're coming down here, and then we have quite a lot of islands. That will probably make it a bit easier. And then we have one more all the way over here in Micronesia. But that's unrelated to this part. That's from May 1974 to Satsawai set sail on a 1,100 mile trip to Saipan and back, the most recent long distance canoe voyage in the Pacific. So that would have been here. One of the tools that was used at the time is what we can see here. With sticks and shells, Marshall Islands navigators map the sea. Bowed sticks mark ocean swells. Curving from contact with the islands, themselves charted by Cori shells. And before we get to the maps of Hawaii, let's quickly look at this part up here. So, it tells us that unlike the early European navigators who feared sailing off the edge of the world, Pacific Islanders faced the ocean with confidence. For the Polynesian, God ancestors ruled an orderly universe. When the sun, moon and planets kept to their appointed paths, when stars predictably rose and set, when the sea itself was the bosom of his ancestor Tangaroa, what was he to fear? So, the Pacific navigator trusted his gods, but at the same time he trained his powers of observation. His compass was the position on the horizon of some 150 rising and setting stars. His chart a mental record of current and swell patterns. For him the flight of a bird, the shape of a cloud, a bit of autumn were significant signals pointing the way to his goal land beyond the horizon. So, we have one example here. There is the little ship 
And here, this mountain in the sea is the destination. And we can see the different stars here above the horizon. We have wind and current influencing the path. The navigator steered towards stars known to rise over the destination island, a process usually complicated by wind and current. Buffeted by wave and wind from port or above, a helmsman chooses a star, one, well to the left of his desired course. There would be here, two, so it's well to the left. He allows for the wind, which he can gauge by his leeway, or angle his boat, makes with its weight. Three. And for current. Four. An angle he must estimate from experience. Such corrections allow him to sail true to his landfall. I cannot miss my island, says a Tikopian navigator. It is where I follow the stars. You can also have ocean swells generated by distant winds. Great undulating seas pulse the open ocean for thousands of miles, providing the navigator with yet another signal. He can maintain a heading by regulating his degree of roll, pitch, or combination of the two motions, which you can see here. Then we have again Sirius and Arcturus, the Zenith stars. So the ones known to pass directly above an island, and that gave voyagers their latitude. By approaching upwind of an island until its Zenith star was overhead, the navigator could then turn due west and run with the wind to his destination, which is what we've just seen here. Then you can also follow the flight paths of birds. But you also have signposts of the sea. The color of the sea might change. The water blue changing to green betrays a familiar reef, enabling the navigator to check his position. Driftwood hints that land lies to windward, while seaweed indicates an upcurrent reef. Light green underside of a cloud heralds the presence of a distant lagoon. And then you also here have these swell patterns. Main swell bounces back from an island, which is what you see here, and bends around it creating swell patterns that reveal the island's bearing. I feel the sea hit the canoe, shake him, like move him go back, says a Polynesian. Meeting the reflected swell at an angle, the navigator turns into it and proceeds toward his unseen landfall. And then again we have birds, cloud formations, and the other signs and um, they can expand a pinpoint landfall by a radius of 25 to 30 miles. Which is pretty impressive.
So, here we have some information on the volcanoes of Hawaii. Like I've said before, most of the islands have volcanic origin. There's some like New Zealand, for example, also part of a submerged continent. At Hawaii, you can also find two of the world's most active volcanoes, which still add land to the island of Hawaii. Mauna Loa is Earth's most massive mountain, with an estimated volume of 19,000 cubic miles. And the interesting thing is, it stands 56,000 feet or 17,000 meters above the depressed sea floor. So the sea floor is being pushed down by the weight. And that makes it 27,000 feet or 8,230 meters taller than Mount Everest. But of course, a large part of it is below sea level. We don't really have explosive volcanoes here but rather more fluid eruptions which produce fiery mountains and rivers of molten lava. And since Hawaii is quite remote, it also took a long time for life to get there. It says here, over a span of 32 million years, plants and animals colonized the Hawaiian Islands at the rate of one insect every 68,000 years, one plant every 98,000 years, and one bird every one million years. These species then changed gradually, evolving new forms better adapted to island life without the predators and competitors of the former homelands, they didn't need elaborate defense mechanisms to survive. Qualities that once protected them proved unnecessary and were eventually lost. And contradictory terms now describe these new life forms. You have nettleless nettles, mintless mints, stinkless stink bugs, and lightless birds. And about 90% of Hawaii's native flora is endemic, which means it's found nowhere else on Earth. Now we have some examples here. The ones with the green numbers are endemic. So, for example, 40 would be the dark lava flow cricket. Or we have here, 43, I think this is this fern here, called Amau. 47, we have a black noddy, a noiu. Another beautiful plant. This one's called Koa. And here on the side we have a Hawaiian goose, Nene, with a black beak and a black face, and a white neck. The white numbers indicate indigenous species, which are naturally occurring in Hawaii, but are also found elsewhere. Like this plant here. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe these are berries. It's called 
Piawe. Well, here we have a bird with a long tail feather, or two actually. This one's a white tailed tropic bird, and three, the pink ones are non native, so these have been introduced by humans. We have wild pigs, we have a small Indian mongoose. And we have cats. So large parts are closed off and protected today. And other areas you can visit, like the volcano here, Mauna Loa. You can take the chain of Craters Road. All the way up here to the crater rim drive. And go around it. So closers are in effect. Or at least were at the time. You can see here that there's a national park. And we can have a closer look at the crater rim drive here, all the way around. There are some steam vents that you can see and sulfur banks which are hazardous volcanic fumes. There's also an art center. And a smaller crater here. And what's pretty interesting, you can see the different fields. And it gives you an idea how active it is. So we have lava flows from before 1924. Then here we have 1971 lava. So up here and here. And then we have indications of 1974 lava and 1982. And of course, it gives you some safety information. So you have to be careful, stay under marked trails, avoid cliffs, earthquakes, and steamers. They may collapse or be slippery. You have to wear sturdy, close toe shoes. And keep in mind that lava fields are shadeless and hot, so better wear sunscreen, a hat and sunglasses, and take water with you. And well, it's not surprising that volcanic eruptions can be hazardous, so areas around erupting winds are closed to travel, and even from a distance, fumes and fallout can irritate lungs and eyes. 
These can be palace hair, cinder, and ash. Again, here, bring water and wear sunscreen. information on the Diamond Head State Monument, Honolulu, Oahu, Hawaii. The overwhelming majority of people living on Hawaii live on the island of Oahu, and again most of them in Honolulu. See here the bus stop, and then you follow the trail. This kind of winds upwards towards stairs, a tunnel, more stairs, spiral staircase to an observation station. A punker here. Oh, God. And you can come back. Here's a cute map of Big Island. 2022 to 23, so that's a very recent one. And it's obviously been put to good use. I'm sure Colette had a great time here. I really like all these little details. The little cars on the road. The way the churches are drawn in, the rodeo arena with the horses, the beach with a little boat out on the waves, a monument to Captain Cook. We have paddle boards here. Family portraits, titanium rings, I'm not sure what these are, and various restaurants and bars, as well as some info on stores, post office. There we have it, the rings. <laughs> Seasonal menus. Fresh, local, and from scratch. Coffee, chocolates, pastries. And here we have this drive around the volcano. There's Mauna Loa with the access road, the national park. A couple of observation towers here. Baumkuchen farm. That sounds interesting. Rainbow Falls. Botanical World Adventures. And you can see here that some 
bit some work. This is the one that we looked at on the other side. And this one up here would be this bit here. Next to where the dolphins are in the water. So again, a big thank you for these wonderful maps and I hope you enjoyed this little exploration of Polynesia and Hawaii. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.